So section three is going to deal with material cycling. So unlike the one-way flow of energy, and we said that energy does flow in one direction from the sun down. Obviously the sun is not taking energy back from us. Matter is going to be recycled within and between the ecosystems. So the biochemical cycles, when elements, chemical compounds, and other forms of matter are passed from one organism to another, and from one part of the biosphere to another. So if we take a look right here, the first one we're going to talk about is the water cycle. Now evaporation is the process by which water changes from a liquid to a gas. Transpiration is when water enters the atmosphere by evaporating from the leaves of plants. So take a look at this diagram right here, the water cycle. We have evaporation from the ocean and transpiration from the plants. It then goes up into the clouds, condenses, precipitates, runs off, we have seepage into the groundwater, and roots uptake the water. So notice that this water that either ran off in, back into the ocean or was uptaken by the roots of plants is then going to re-enter the cycle through evaporation and transpiration. So it's going to keep going. That water will continue to move. Now every living organism needs to grow and carry out essential life functions. Like water, Nutrients are passed between organisms and the environment through biogeochemical cycles. Nutrients are all the chemical substances that an organism requires to live. So let's take a look at the carbon cycle. Of all the carbon on Earth, less than 1% of that carbon circulates in the biosphere. So carbon is going to cycle through biological processes of photosynthesis, respiration, and decomposition. So photosynthesis takes in carbon, respiration gives off carbon. Geochemical processes, such as the release of CO2 from the atmosphere by volcanoes. Mixed biogeochemical processes, such as the burial of carbon-rich remains of organisms, and their conversion into fossil fuels by the pressure of the overlying earth. So a lot of our fuel you now came from the Carboniferous period, All right, so that's from before the time of dinosaurs. Our fuel was deposited on Earth, compressed, and became fossil fuels. And then those fossil fuels, burning of them, and cutting and burning of forests, is going to release that CO2 back into the atmosphere. So here we have the diagram of CO2. We have the volcanic activity. We have photosynthesis and respiration represented, human activity. Uh, oceans are going to take in a lot of CO2 for photosynthetic organisms in the ocean. All right, so... And this is only going to be about 1% of carbon is going to move. Now, nitrogen fixation, uh, when bacteria converts nitrogen into ammonia. So bacteria converting nitrogen into ammonia is going to be nitrogen fixation. And denitrification is when soil bacteria convert nitrate into nitrogen gas. And the nitrogen cycle... Nitrogen is used in the creation of amino acids, which become proteins. So we can see how important that is because we need, to, we need nitrogen to create proteins. So it needs to be cycled. So here's a diagram of the nitrogen cycle right here between uptake and excretion. Nitrification, denitrification are all represented here. Okay. Now the phosphorus cycle isn't going to be as important, but we'll talk about it. Uh, and we're not going to deal with it as much but it is used to create DNA and RNA. And it's mostly found in land uh, or rock or soil. Okay, It's not going to enter the atmosphere, so it's going to be, have to cycle without going into the atmosphere. And here's the phosphorus cycle right there, just cycling between either living or non-living organism. Primary productivity is the rate at which organic matter is created by producers. A limiting nutrient is nutrients that are scarce or cycle slowly and limits an ecosystem. And an algal bloom is a result when an aquatic ecosystem gets a large amount of a limiting nutrient. So a limiting nutrient is going to be something that is going to prevent, you know, it's going to make, it's going to limit growth, right? If there's enough of it, you're going to have a large amount of growth. If there's not a lot of it, you're not going to have a lot of growth, okay? Characteristics of an ecosystem. Uh, an ecosystem involves interaction between living and non-living factors. An ecosystem is self-sustaining when these two conditions are met. 
Now this is important. There must be a constant flow of energy into the ecosystem, and there must be organisms within that ecosystem that can use this energy for the synthesis of organic compounds. And second, there must be recycling. Okay, so we talked about energy flow last section. In this section, we talked about recycling. So there has to be a recycling of materials. There has to be a constant flow of energy in. Now, biotic. Biotic is living. Biotic factors are living factors that affect an environment. Abiotic is not living. Examples of abiotic factors, intensity of light, temperature, water, type of soil, availability availability of minerals and other inorganic substances, supply of gases including carbon dioxide, oxygen, nitrogen, and pH. Abiotic factors vary from one area to another. Abiotic factors are going to be the limiting factors. Okay. Saprophytes are organisms that obtain nutrients from the remains of dead organisms. Predators are carnivores that kill and eat their prey. And scavengers feed on the remains of animals that they have not killed. Symbiotic relationships. Symbiosis is when different organisms live together in close association. These relationships may or may not be beneficial to the organism. So commensalism is when one organism benefits while the other is neither helped nor harmed. Mutualism is when both organisms benefit. And parasitism is when one organism benefits while the other is harmed. So if we take a look at mutualism right here, this is a crocodile and a plover. Now the crocodile is not going to eat the plover. What it's doing is it has the plover is going around and cleaning its teeth. Now the plover gets a food source and the crocodile gets clean teeth. So they both benefit in this scenario. Parasitism this is a kind of caterpillar, and these are wasp eggs on it. So what's going to happen is when those wasp eggs hatch, they're going to eat the caterpillar to death. Um, so one organism benefits, the wasp, and uh, the caterpillar does not benefit. Okay. And commensalism, we see right here, there are barnacles on the fin of a whale. Uh, they get transportation, and the whale doesn't even know they're there. All right. And finally, we're going to close off with carrying capacity is the maximum amount of organisms that can be contained within an ecosystem based on the amount of resources available in that area. So if we look at the classroom, it has 36 seats. That is the carrying capacity of the classroom, so the amount of resources available. Habitat is the living environment. Competition is the struggle between different organisms for the same re same limited resources, and a niche is the role that a species fills in its particular habitat. So if we were to look at the, the classroom here, uh, the niche you fill is student, the niche I fill is teacher. Okay, so it's the role that the species fills.